Growth is normal and is expected. Growth is seen by increase in stature, ability, maturity and responsibility. We discuss how we grow spiritually as we look at six key elements to growth. Spiritual growth causes increase in Christ-likeness and fruitfulness. Why don't we stand up to our feet, make our declaration this morning, and then we'll get into God's Word uh, together. So uh, if you have brought your Bible, just like you do, hold it high up in the air and just say this out loud, bold, and strong with me. This is God's Word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe his word, and I live by his word. Christ is my master, and to him I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Please turn around to somebody next to you. Say hi, get to know them, and uh, you may be seated after that. God bless you. All right, this morning, I want us to spend some time Talking about growing. In life, this is one thing that hopefully keeps on happening. We keep on growing. Whether it's in the natural, you know, we keep growing physically. Or whether it's professional, professionally, vocationally, we keep on growing. And so, so also... Spiritually, it's important for us to keep growing. Now, in the natural, we look at growth, uh, or we can, growth becomes evident when a person uh, increases in their stature, or in their ability, or in their uh, maturity, or in their responsibility. They're able to carry responsibility, they're able to do things. So we say, yeah, that person's really growing up, you know. So we, uh, growth becomes evident in the natural through these things. And uh, what I want us to understand is that even in our spiritual lives, God wants us to keep on growing. Having come to faith in Christ is only the beginning. It's not the end in itself. It's the beginning. I now have made a decision to believe in Jesus Christ. I'm born again. I'm a believer in Jesus. Well, you've begun your journey of spiritual growth. So we've got to keep on growing. So I just want to quickly uh, uh, refer to some verses here that, that tell us that we're supposed to be growing spiritually. Then we're quickly referring to these verses, not necessarily explaining each of them. Look at Ephesians 4, 15. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, the Bible says that speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things to be like Christ, to, to, into him who is the head, that is Jesus Christ. So in all things, we are supposed to keep growing up. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, Paul writes to the Thessalonians, he says, I, I thank God for you, brothers, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly. Faith is something that can grow. It's like a muscle. It can increase in its strength, in its ability to do things. So he says, your faith is growing, and I'm giving thanks to God for that. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, the Bible tells us, As newborn babies, desire the pure milk of the word so that you can grow by it. So it says, desire the milk so that you can grow. And in, that same, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, as Peter uh, writes, uh, completes his letter, he says, But grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So spiritual growth is something God invites all of us to keep on growing spiritually. And uh, there are two very important uh, things that 
makes spiritual growth evident, that we can tell that somebody is growing. One, when you're saying spiritual growth, we're saying we are increasing in Christ-likeness. I'm becoming more and more like Jesus. Now, you know, in, 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 the, in the medical field, uh, we have what we would call as growth chart. Especially for the little babies all the way, you know, till they are 10 or 11, there's a growth chart with certain milestones. And if they're hitting those milestones, we're saying, well, they're growing normally. There's a growth, growth chart, something to compare against. Spiritually, our growth chart is something that references Jesus Christ himself. So if we are growing more and more, becoming more and more like Jesus, being changed, then we say we are growing spiritually. You're with me so far? That means I'm, when I'm able to walk in his character, walk in his love, walk in, in the way Christ would walk, I'm becoming more and more like Jesus. I am growing spiritually. Another evidence of spiritual growth is increased fruitfulness. That means increased usefulness and productivity for the kingdom of God. That, you're, that you and I are not just, you know, uh, existing or just being there as believers, but we are productive. We are bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. Increased fruitfulness, usefulness for God's kingdom is also an important evidence for growth. What I want to do this morning is for us to just discuss how growth happens. And we're going to draw comparisons from the natural and apply those, those comparisons to our spiritual life. How does growth happen? Now, if we sit down and think about this, we could probably identify some of these uh, areas, and I've just mentioned them here. Obviously, here are the key elements for growth. You need to be eating. You need to exercise, exercising. You need to be training. You need to be stretching. There's also testing and the one all of us enjoy is resting. But all these are important parts of growth. Now, just keep in mind that these things happen continuously. You know, none of us can say, well, I slept seven hours, uh, you know, yesterday, so I don't need to sleep again. No, it happens every day, at least for most of us. <laughs> There's all these things happen on a, on a continual basis in our lives for us to keep on growing. So also in our spiritual lives, all six of these elements should keep on happening. This keep on taking part, happening in your life so that you keep on growing. I want to just talk about each one of these things and uh, hopefully it will encourage us and stir us up to work on these things as we journey with God through this year ahead. So let's talk about the first one, eating. You know, some of us have been eating masal dosas from the time we were, I don't know, two, <laughs> as long as you can remember. But you never stop. You, you still have a masal dosa again. You still have, you know, your whatever you, you eat, the bread and the the puri and whatever. You, we keep on eating. Keep on eating. You never stop. And the same is true when we talk about spiritual food, which is the word of God. God's word is spiritual food. It's nourishment for our spirit, our inner man. Jesus said, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of it's the same word, but you never get tired of it. You keep on nourishing your spirit on the words of Scripture. Just keep going back to it, nourishing your spirit. Keep reading the word. Keep meditating in it. Keep taking it in. It's spiritual food. But the other thing is this. We begin with milk, but we must move on to solid foods. That's also another progression for growth. Babies, they start off with milk, but at some point, they start consuming solid food. And the same thing must happen for us spiritually. So we begin with the milk of the word, but then we need to move on to have the solid meat of the word of God. So uh, the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, he says, he tells us about this. He says, you know, 
I want you to, and I'm just paraphrasing this. He says, I don't want you to be babies, but I want you to have solid meat, which is the word of God, which teaches you how to discern right and wrong. And then he goes on in chapter 6, is continuing with the same thought, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, let us leave aside the first principles or the foundational truths. And let us press on to things which bring about perfection, which bring about maturity. And he also mentions what are those foundational truths. He mentions things like repentance from dead works, having faith toward God, baptisms. And these are foundational things. So you hear them, you understand them, you apply them in your life, but you don't stay there. You need to now move on to things in the word that bring maturity, that teach you to know what is right and wrong. For example, a little baby needs to be, is fed with milk and needs to be told what is right and wrong. Don't put your hand in the fire. Don't run across the road. Stay indoors. Always taught what is right and wrong. But as the child grows up, becomes a young adult, hopefully they know what is right and wrong. They know what is right and wrong. They've grown up. And so also in our spiritual life, a sign of growing up, of being able to consume solid meat is that you're now, you've been taught and trained and you're able to discern what is right and what is wrong. And you are now moving on to mature things that bring about maturity, things that help you become more and more like Jesus. So you're not doing that same thing again. You need to ask God to forgive your sins. You need to ask God, you know, you're loved, you're saved by grace. And, you know, those are foundational. They're important, but they are foundational. You need to move on to things that help you bring about maturity, becoming more and more like Jesus. So I want to ask you and me as believers, what are you feeding your spirit with? You know, sometimes we're like candy Christians. We want candy all the time. Just tell me I'm nice. Tell me I'm good. I'm loved by God. And You know, those things are important, but you can't live on candy all the time. Yes, you're blessed. Yes, you're loved. But God wants to deal with stuff in your life. God wants you to grow up. God wants you to mature. God wants you to be an overcomer. God wants you to live a victorious life. God wants you to start being a blessing to other people. God wants you to start serving in his kingdom. So you need to be moved from being a candy Christian to being somebody who consumes solid meat who is pressing on to perfection. Are you with me? So for growth, eating is important. What you consume is important. You need to start delving in and taking in the solid meat of God's word and uh, spend time in God's word reading and studying it. Second thing is exercising. A second important part of growing is exercising. So not only do we nourish our bodies, but then you need to do something. You need to go out and be active and and exercise physically. So also in the spirit, spiritual exercise is simply applying the word of God. Like what James said in James chapter 1 verse 22. He said, don't be hearers of the word, but also be doers. So what is spiritual exercise? You do the word. So it's one thing to learn, it's one thing to understand, but then you say, okay, this is what God has said, so I'm going to do what God has said. I'm going to apply it in my life. I begin to put it into practice, whether you're a student, uh, you're in college, or you're in the workplace, you begin to apply the word of God. You are now exercising. You are being a doer of the word. So challenge yourself and we should challenge ourselves as believers. I come to church not only to hear sermons, I come to church not only to, you know, know what the Bible says, but I should get out there and exercise. I need to apply the word to my life situations. If God is speaking to me about something I need to do in my life, I need to get out there and do it. That's exercising. You're being a doer of the word. And that brings about growth and uh, uh, maturity. We're increasing spiritually. You're with me so far? The third thing is training. Now, this is something those of us in the workplace are familiar with. Even though you've, you know, you've studied your bachelor's or you may even have a master's degree or some may even have a PhD and that's great. But when you get into the workplace, you still go through training 
through various stages in your professional life. So you keep on learning. So when you talk about training, we're talking about putting yourself under rigorous learning. It could be something that you put on yourself, you go through it yourself, or it could be with the assistance of others. We would call them coaches or trainers or, or whatever you would you know, want to call them. That means somebody else is coaching you, somebody else is training you. Either way, you're submitting yourself to some rigorous learning. So that training is important. So in, your, in our spiritual life, yes, it's important to read the Word of God. But I want to challenge you and me that if you and I need to grow spiritually, we need more than that. We need to bring ourselves under some rigorous study and schooling of God's Word and the Holy Spirit. That means you, be, you begin to study the Word of God. Uh, you could take a subject, a topic, study the Word. What does the Bible say about this? Read some books about a subject and you study the book and you study the Word of God together. You are putting yourself under some rigorous learning to uh, train yourself in and equip yourself in a certain area. Or you permit somebody else to train you, coach you, to you, you receive through the training and the impartation that other people can bring into your life. Are you with me? So that's also an important part of growing up spiritually. So uh, in the church, we provide various resources to train people. We know we have the weekend schools, we have the publications, uh, we have people who can work with you. And so we try to impart, we try to put, put things in and, and help one another so that we can train and lift each other up to higher levels. L let me just talk a little bit about training because I feel this is so important here. You know, in Scripture, we find how Paul trained Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 Paul trained up this young man, Timothy, to be a minister of God. So, uh, how did he do it? It says that in 2 Timothy 3.10, he tells Timothy, You carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, my love, my perseverance. In other words, Timothy was trained by Paul as Paul gave him the opportunity to not only learn from his teaching, what he taught, but also to see how he lived his life. He carefully followed his manner of life. Oh, this is how he's living. He carefully followed how he went through hardships. How he endured afflictions. How he loved people. How he had faith in God. So, Timothy looked at all these things in Paul's life. And through that, he was trained up to be a man of God himself. And so, later on, you find Paul telling Timothy, Timothy, I want you to do this for others. Second Timothy, uh, chapter 2, verse 2. Paul tells Timothy, the things that you've learned of me, I want you to give to other people. Commit it to other faithful men who will be able to train others also. In other words, I've trained you. Now you train others who then can train more people. So that's the way this whole thing should happen. And that's what we want to see happen here at church. So, you know, technically we would use the word discipleship or sometimes people use the word mentoring. So, you know, it doesn't matter what word you use, whether you use training or mentoring or coaching or discipling. The point is we want, we should create a culture in our church here where those of us who are little bit more, who are more mature, should work with younger people to help bring them up and train them so that they can rise up and grow to higher levels in their walk with God. Are you with me so far? Each one of us should work. As we grow up, we turn around and we help others grow up. So I want to challenge you and I as as. Uh, as believers in Jesus, as people who are following Jesus, one of the key things that you can look at your own life as, as, as an indicator of growth is not only you receive training, but are you turning around and training other people in their walk with God? Are you helping other people grow up in their walk with God? Find people who are maybe younger than you, not necessarily in age, but maybe spiritually, uh, and, and just work with them, help them. Then you are training 
others. You're discipling others. So I want to share just a few thoughts here on this whole discipleship process or how we want to see this and, and create a culture here in church on discipling people. So remember that discipleship is about developing people, not about just improving programs. So yes, we want to you know, sharpen and refine the programs, the different things, the resources we offer. The programs are just resources that we offer people. But really, discipleship is about building people. It's about developing people. So are people being built up? Are people being discipled? And it's not about, discipleship again is not about filling people with information. You know, here you know this, you learn this, you learn this, you learn this. People can get so, you know, have a lot of information, but that's not what discipleship is. Discipleship is about life transformation. Now, yes, to some extent you need information, you need to teach people, you need to train people, that's good. But ultimately, we want to see life change. So discipleship is about life transformation. How? To help people become more and more like Jesus. So how can we, you know, how can we say if someone is growing, uh, as, uh, developing as a disciple? So when you're working with somebody, you're helping them, nurture them. How can you tell uh, that somebody is becoming more like Christ? And I've just put down some thoughts here. You know, how, uh, how can we know if someone is developing as a disciple? You see they're growing in their commitment to Christ. That means they're no longer shaky in their commitment to Jesus. You know, one day off, one day on, one day off, two days on. It's not like that. They are committed. No turning back. I'm committed to Jesus Christ. His word. The work of His Holy Spirit. That's a sign that they're becoming disciples. They're growing in Christ-likeness in their life, in their character. So yeah, that person is growing. So I, can, I know that he's, be, he's becoming a disciple. Uh, he's growing in Christian disciplines. That means he's praying. He's spending time in the word. Uh, he's being a witness uh, for Jesus. Uh, he's growing into their life's purposes. That means he's recognizing that, you know, this is what God has called me to do. This is what I should start doing and, and start moving. And he's finding meaning in whatever he's doing. His vocation becomes meaningful and useful for the purposes of God's kingdom. That's an indicator that he's becoming a disciple. And then he also turns around and starts discipling others. So they say now he's becoming a disciple. Why? Because now he's not only being trained, but he's turning around and training other people. Every one of us here should at some point start doing this if you're not doing it already. Are you with me? Because we're all, as part of our growth, we not only receive training or discipling, but we need to turn around and start discipling other people. Now, how do you do this? Basically, when you're talking about a discipling culture, you know, we need to take interest and work with others to help them grow spiritually. So it's not just on Sunday morning, hi, how, hi, how are you? Nice to see you. And wait till next Sunday. I mean, that's okay. That's, you know, you greet one another in church. But we need to go beyond that and take interest in people and say, I want to work with them. Now, I have my list. Currently, I have about 15 people on my list. And I, so this is not our pastoral team. I'm responsible for our pastoral team. I take care of them. But these are young people that I've met across our locations. Now, they're on my list. I am committing myself to work with them. So I will text them. I will call them. I will schedule meetings with them. Why? I want to work with them to help them grow. Now, these are already believers. But I want to see them become ministers of God. So we have a growth progression. New believers should become disciples. Disciples should become ministers. Ministers should become leaders. So my goal is to see them all become leaders. That means they are carrying responsibility in the house of God. So as each of these transition to being leaders, I'll pick up some more people. Start working with them. And you can start doing the same thing. I'm not doing it just because I'm a pastor. But it's because I care. I'm committed to seeing build, and building up people. Now, some of them may stay here. Now, because of the nature of the people we have, people keep moving. So you equip them, and some of them they may move to other parts of the world because of their jobs. It's okay. You've trained somebody, and wherever they go, 
they're going to be useful for the kingdom of God. So it doesn't matter if they all, it doesn't mean that they all have to stay in church. They will go to different parts of the world. That's okay. But you've discipled them. You've raised them up to be leaders. And wherever they go, they know how to carry responsibility. They've gone from just being new believers. They are leaders in the house of God. Are you with me? So each one of us must start doing that. Find two or three people. Work with them. You know, and, and, and encourage them. How do you, uh, what are some of the things that, we, that, you know, that define a good training or discipling culture in a local church? And here's some pointers just to help us start working on this. I probably will repeat this uh, later on uh, in the year. Now, what are some things that we can look for that, that say that this, is, this church has a discipling culture? They are actually helping people grow from becoming from new believers to becoming leaders in the house of God. Here are these things. First of all, there are connections that happen. And these are one-on-one. -on -one. Connections can happen one-on-one. -on -one. They can, of course, happen in group settings, like in life groups. Or they can happen across generations, younger to older, and all of that. But when connections are happening, people are really connecting. You say, yeah, that's a discipling culture. People are working with one another to help others grow. Secondly, uh, discipleship. It's, it's based on relationships, and it is life-centric than program-centric. That means we do have programs. We do have weekend schools and workshops and books and all of that. But those are only tools. But what we're looking at is how their lives are changing. It's not have they attended this program, attended that program, attended that program. That is good. Let them, we need to encourage people to participate and attend. But all of that is for the purpose of life transformation. Is their life changing? Then you say, discipleship is happening. A third thing is this, that people are encouraged to grow as they recognize needs in their life. And we don't script their journey, we only help shape their journey. That means we don't come and say, here, here's a checklist, check off all these things, and then I can tell you, you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. We don't do that. But we do provide resources to help shape their journey. We say we have what is called as foundations. We have life groups. We have weekend schools. We have books. We have the Sunday services. These are all things around you to help shape you. But we will not script your personal journey. You have to recognize your need. And you step into whatever you want to step in at whatever time. We cannot force that for you. Are you understanding? So we, 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 we help shape, but we don't script people's journeys. And lastly, we, when we disciple, we must disciple people in the middle of life situations, uh, not outside of life. You know, it's like on the job, you have on-the-job training. You may have classroom training, but you learn a whole lot more when you are on the job. It's hap learning happens in the middle of life, not outside of life. So, in as much as we tell, you know, people, you attend life group or so on, most important is, we say, getting involved in church. Start doing something. Because as you're doing something, you're going to learn. You're going to learn. You're on the job. You're being trained. Be a part of some team in church. Go on mission trips. There you will learn a lot very quickly. You'll grow up very quickly. So, learning happens in the middle of life not outside of life. Are you with me so far? So when we build people with these, uh, with, in this kind of a way, you know, we can say that that church really is discipling people. It's really building people up. It's not just keeping people, retaining people to sit on the chairs Sunday after Sunday, but it's really building people up, taking them from being new believers to becoming leaders in the house of God. So training is very important, and I purposely spend a lot of time on that. Let's go to number four. Part of our spiritual growth is stretching. Stretching means you step out of what you're comfortable and you start taking on responsibilities or challenges or roles that may be bigger than you, but you rise up to that occasion. And when you do that, you grow very, very quickly. And even on the job, you know, your boss comes and says, hey, you know, let's say you've been a, you know, you've been a developer on your team and you're just, you know, happily coding. And suddenly your boss says, okay, you know, uh, we want, we've, you know, we've seen you doing very well. Now we want you to lead a team. It's like, I've never done it before. Of course you've never done it before. But you step into that role, you grow up, you take on the challenge, and you have now, you're not only responsible for what you do, but you now become responsible maybe for four others on a team. 
So immediately you're, you're being stretched, but it helps you grow. So also in spiritual things. We need to allow God to stretch us. To take on some responsibilities. To go beyond what we are comfortable doing. And as you stretch, you grow. Are you with me? So when, you know, when pastor or one of the team leaders, one of the pastors come to you and say, hey, can you take on this responsibility? Don't say, oh, no, 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 no. Look at somebody else. <laughs> no, rise up to the occasion. Yes, I can. I'll take it up with God's help. I'll do it. I may have never done it before, but I'll do it. I'll take it up. And you know, when people take up those responsibilities, they grow. And many of the leaders that you see in church today are people who have grown like that. We've seen them grow. You know, initially they came and they were just doing a little bit of things. Then we gave them a little responsibility. They rose up to it. Then we gave them some more. Rose up to it. The next thing we know, we push them up into, you know, take on responsibility in the whole ministry area. And they're, they, they're ready. They rise up to it. They're handling that whole area. But we've seen them grow. They were willing to be stretched, rising up to new levels. And I want to challenge you, for your own growth spiritually, let God stretch you. As new opportunities come your way, rise up to those things. When you, when you face something you've never faced before, here's a scripture that, that really encourages me, 2 Corinthians 3, 5 and 6. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Who also has made us able ministers of the new covenant. That means my sufficiency is not from myself. My sufficiency is of God. And he is the one who makes me an able, a capable minister of God. So in spiritual life, as God gives you places before you, challenges and opportunities and roles that you may have never stepped into, but God gives that to you, rise up to it. Knowing that your sufficiency comes from God. Yes, I'll step in. I'll take it up. Because my sufficiency comes from God. And God makes me an able minister. Number five. Something we all enjoy. No, not yet. <laughs> Number five is testing. Those exams we have in life. Now in school or college... Depending on how you viewed exams, uh, your response could be, our responses could be different. Resp exams or tests are not the teacher saying, you're good for nothing, stay here. No. Tests are an invitation for promotion. Just pass the test. You pass the test, we know we can promote you. We know we can put you in a higher grade because you passed the test. So also with God. God tests us. God's tests are simply invitations to walk at a higher level with Him. Are you with me? God's tests are not for you to, you know, not, God is not saying you're good for nothing. I just want you to know how foolish you are. <laughs> no. God's tests are, come, I want to move you up to a higher level in your walk with me. Now, there's a difference between tests and temptations and attacks of the devil. Now, sometimes believers confuse all the three. God does not tempt us. It's the devil who tempts us. Temptations are an inducement to sin. It's an invitation for demotion. God's tests are to promote us. You with me? So the devil tempts us. He says, come and do all the wrong things. And, and, and they're just invitations for us to do the wrong things. And, you know, just causes us to go down. Or the devil attacks us. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy what God has given to us. So the temptations of the devil, the attacks of the devil must be differentiated between the tests that God gives to us, which are just invitations to rise up to a higher level. Now here's the thing. Whether it's a test from God, whether it's a temptation of the devil, whether it's uh, an attack of the enemy, whenever you and I overcome, we, or whenever we pass the test or overcome the temptation or the attack, we will move to a new level in our walk with God. You with me? Amen? So even when there's temptation, even when there's an attack, don't look at it as negative. Say, hey, look, devil, I know I'm going to overcome. 
And I'm going to overcome and I'm beginning to walk in a new level with God. I'm going to learn something about God. I'm going to grow in my, deepen my relationship with God. Even when the enemy comes with temptation or the enemy comes with an attack. It's only going to help me go up to a new level. Now, in scripture, and I just present this to you. I'm not explaining all of them in detail. There are several tests that we see in the Bible especially in the Old Testament, but keep in mind everything that we saw in the Old Testament, the Bible says they are lessons for us believers in the New Testament. That's in Romans 15. But here are some tests that we see that God presented his people with in the Bible. And I've just given names to it just to communicate them to us. First of all, there's the endurance test. So God tells Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to bless you with a child, Abraham and Sarah. But then he waits 25 years before he can give them a child. All he needed was nine months, but he waited 25 years. Why? The endurance test. Hebrews 6 and verse 12 says that through faith and patience, he obtained that promise. Then there is the blessing test, which God gave to Abraham in Genesis 22, verse 1 and 2. After Abraham had Isaac, the child, his son, God comes to him and says, Okay, Abraham, I'm going to test you. Will you take your son, your only son Isaac, and offer him up as a sacrifice? Now, God knew he was not going to take that sacrifice, but he was testing Abraham. I've given you a blessing. Are you willing to release the blessing back to me? I want to know where your eyes are. Are your eyes are on my promise or are your eyes on my blessing? Now, Abraham did the right thing. Hebrews 11 says that Abraham offered, was willing to offer up Isaac because his eyes was on the promise and he knew. That even if he killed Isaac, God would still raise him back because that was the promise. Are you with me so far? So God tests the promise, the blessing test. A third test we see in scripture is the promise test for Joseph. So Joseph had these wonderful dreams uh, that he was going to you know, have people bow down before him. He's going to come to a place of honor. But the next thing you know happened in Joseph's life is, is the whole his life is on a downward spiral. He ends up as a servant and then he ends up in prison. But what was the promise? I'll bring you to a place of honor. Where was he? A prisoner. Totally opposite. But that's a promise test. And the Bible says in Psalm 105 that the word of the Lord tested him. The promise God gave to him tested him. Do you really believe this promise? Joseph passed the test. The next thing we see is he goes from being a prisoner to becoming prime minister. Another test we see in scripture is the abundance test. We read about this in Exodus 16.4 and Deuteronomy 8.23. But God says, I will bless you with abundance. But while I bless you with abundance, I'm watching where your heart is. So the abundance you have is also a test from God. To make sure that your heart is fixed on the Lord, not on the abundance that he has blessed you with. And the last test here that I want to mention that we see in scripture is the adversity test. It's interesting, you read about this in Judges chapter 2 verse 20 to 23 and chapter 3 verses 1 to 6. Where God speaks to the people of Israel and he says, you know, Joshua has conquered all these enemies. But I've kept some enemies aside purposely. Because I want to test you and I want to teach you how to war. So as I kept these enemies around you because I want to test you and I want to teach you how to war. The adversity test. Now remember all these tests, the intent is always good to get you up in your walk with God, not to demote you. Are you with me? So, when God, testing is important, we need to pass those tests. Overcome temptations. Rise about tribulations of life. Oh, uh, stand up against the attacks of the enemy. All these things will cause us to move to higher levels of spiritual growth. What if you fail a test? Try again. If you fail a test, just do it again. Say, God, I know I messed up last time. But God, I want to pass it. Give me the strength. Give me the wisdom. I want to pass the test. So don't give up. God is always on our side. And then he raises up to new levels. And the last one is about resting. I won't speak much about this because we talked about this last Sunday. The importance of spending time in quietness and solitude before God. Whether in praising and worshiping and prayer. Uh, just letting God refresh and renew us. 
it's like in the natural we need sleep and we most of us sleep every day. We need it. It's important. It rejuvenates our body. And we need sufficient of that. Say so also in the spiritual. You need that place and the time for rest to be in solitude with God, being refreshed in his presence. So this morning, as I conclude, just to remind all of us, we have to keep growing spiritually. And you and I know how growth happens. What are the six elements there? Eating, exercise, training, stretching, testing, rest. We need that on an ongoing basis in our lives. And I want to encourage you to keep on growing spiritually. Involve yourself. Engage in all of these. Check up on your spiritual life. Am I eating right spiritually? Am I doing the word? Or do I just come listen to a Sunday sermon and forget about it? Am I challenging myself to apply the word in my life? Am I training? Am I being trained? Am I receiving training either through something that I take on with the help of the Holy Spirit myself or do I receive input from other people? Am I stretching myself? Am I taking responsibilities for the kingdom of God? Am I, test, am I passing God's tests over my life? And, and am I getting sufficient rest in the presence of God? Keep growing spiritually. Help others to grow in their faith. Amen? Thank you for your patient endurance. <laughs> Let's rise to our feet. <laughs> Let's call our worship team up, please. and Let's take a few moments just to pray. And I want you to take, just take a few moments to pray for yourself personally and say, God, help me to grow. Help me to keep growing in you. Help me to keep growing spiritually. In one way, it's dangerous not to grow because if we are stagnant, then all kinds of wrong things come in into what is stagnant. Or if we're not stagnant and, and we're not growing, then we're only receding. We're becoming weaker, and that's not good. So challenge yourself. I need to grow spiritually. I've heard what it takes to keep growing. And also challenge yourself to help others grow spiritually. Find some people that you can follow up with, you spend time with, you interact with, you, you help them, challenge them to grow spiritually. Let's take a few moments just to pray uh, right now. Father, I just pray that everyone here, God, will keep growing spiritually. The goal from just being believers to becoming disciples, to becoming ministers of God, to becoming leaders in the house of God and for the purposes of God. I pray that you will train, you will nurture, you will disciple people, God. Use us. Work through us. Work in our community, God, as, be as believers. To raise up men and women was strong in their faith and bearing much fruit for the kingdom of God. We pray that people will grow spiritually in their walk with you. We thank you, Father. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a few moments to sing and then...
plans for me Take my will and for me Father, we just pray that you will help us create this culture here in this church, God. A culture where we help one another grow up in you. That together we grow up in all things to be like Jesus. That we take responsibility for one another, God begin to nurture people. We pray that there will be a move of your Holy Spirit causing these things to happen. They're in homes, in coffee shops, in all kinds of places people will disciple. In the middle of life, we'll help one another, disciple one another, God. And you'll cause this, you'll bring this about, put this in our hearts to care for one another. Nurture people up to grow in our spiritual walk, in our walk with you. And God, we pray you will use us not only to build people up in this community, but use us, God, to bless our city. Use us to bless this nation. That you'll raise up people who will be able to disciple, nurture people. In other churches and other congregations across the city, across the land. Make us a blessing, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. We're going to close and dismiss, and after that, I'll be available just to pray and I'll minister to people who would need that. Let's close.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the sweet fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Keep growing and help others grow. Amen? God bless. See you again. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.